And once again, thank you, Jan and Florian. I hope, we hope you had a great lunch break. Thank you very much for joining us for the drone photo. And it's a, it is our pleasure to welcome you to our next talk here on the center stage. Our next speaker is former CTO and co-founder of T3N. And since a couple of years, he shifted his focus and is now a part-time development consultant and part-time dad. So I'm very excited to look forward to his experiences that he's going to share with us. So please give a warm applause for Martin. Welcome to my talk, how to touch uh, business critical web applications. My name is Martin Brueggemann and I co-founded T3N in 2005 and I left the company in 2020 and now I'm a tech coach uh, helping companies, big companies, mostly um, maintaining their complex software, building prototypes and choosing the right tech stack. In my free time, I go riding with my road bike and yeah, do some mountaineering and running. Um, I want to s speak about what I mean with uh, business critical. Uh, business critical means earning money for me. And you can build a lot of software, but if it doesn't earn money, it's not business critical for me. It has to pay the bill at the end of the month. And with web applications, I mean software that runs 24-7, always. So if a customer decides to buy something on the weekend, at the weekend, he must do this. So you don't have any yeah, space to maintain it or take it down. And there are different concepts to maintain such a software. And there's this old saying, many of you will know this, never change a running system. And if we look at how this uh, looks in reality, it's, it looks like that. And you see the, at the beginning, you invest in the, into the software, you, you build the software, um, everyone wants to get it live, and then you launch it, and you earn some money, it, um, the business model works, and then you forget it. You do another project, and it's live, so why should you put in maintenance into it? And then there, there comes this point where everyone gets nervous, and mostly that's the time where people call me and say, hey, uh, we have a scalability problem, or uh, yeah, you, could, you should look at our software, we have a small problem, so, and then I look at the code and, oh, okay, it's another build and forget project. So, um, I think it's better to always improve the running system. Um, you launch it, it looks, uh, the beginning looks the same. You invest a lot of money and resources, you build the project, and then you put it live, and the difference is you keep a steady pace in doing maintenance. And it's not much, but you keep the software alive, you update your dependencies, and yeah, there's no crash anymore. And let's do a reality check. Um, I am, I'm talking to a lot of customers and friends and other developers, and um, I brought some statements with me. There's this statement from Sebastian who said, software often becomes legacy software as soon as it goes live. And I thought about this and, yeah, why is it like this? And another friend of mine said, legacy software earns the money. Okay. Why is it legacy software that earns the money so often? And if you think about what you're using every day, 
there's legacy software everywhere. Um, mobility providers use it, SaaS companies, um, your government, banks, agencies, logistic providers, and maybe your company. Are you using legacy software? Who's using legacy software? Hands up? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, to be honest, I thought nobody uh, put his hands up, but okay, it's a really honest audience. And yeah, if you want to take one learning um, with you today, I say never stop maintaining. And this is me on the roof of our house. Um, yeah, I hadn't a problem with the roof, but I thought it would be nice after 10 years to just seal it again. Um, I had some trouble to explain it to my wife, but uh, my idea was to be happy in the next 10 years. So, yeah, I just did it. Now I want to tell you a personal story. Um, in 2004, and yes, I'm old, um, my father asked me if I could, buy, uh, could build him a cheese shop. Um, you may wonder why a cheese shop I don't know, he was a successful consultant in the food industry, and I was studying, needed the money, so I thought, okay, I built a cheese shop. Um, I used Type 3 for it and built a custom extension. Um, there was no e-commerce open source shop source system back then. So, yeah, I built it for him. It had some basic order management and product management in TypoScript and all that ugly stuff. And um, yeah, then in 2005, a large banking software company asked me if I could build them a B2B shop. And I said, yeah, why not? I have this cheese shop. Maybe I can improve it a bit and then, okay. So it got cross-selling and B2B price calculation and such things. <laughs> And they were happy, I sold it to them. Yeah, is this the end? No. In 2005, um, I founded this company called uh, T3N, or Yeebase, that's the company name, together with other colleagues. And yeah, we uh, produced the magazine, the first issue, we had um, business success. But then someone uh, mentioned that we, we don't have a shop. So, you already know it. I took the old cheese shop. And yeah, uh, 19,000 lines of code later. Um, some years later, it had 19,000 lines of code in one file. And the problem was just, um, I didn't have the, the time to refactor it and make it nice and make it flexible. And we had all that success, so I, I needed to take some decisions and just, yeah, extend it in lines of code, not nice code. Yeah, and then come, came the point where um, in 2014, we had to relaunch everything. We, we did a complete rewrite. There was just this point where we noticed that the, the old store, um, yeah, can't survive. So it took us two years and many painful hours to build the new project. And yeah, we had some nice things like multiple payment methods, real subscriptions. We could write invoices instead of only send out one invoice and forget it. <laughs> and we used Float for that. And um, it helped us a lot. We had things like uh, message queues, event sourcing, uh, a nice REST API, and it helped us really to grow our business and be successful. And now comes the interesting point. Um, I looked at the website yesterday, and it's still live. It's the old store from 2014. We made about we handled about 50 million euro order volume during the launch. And yeah, it's still based on flow. But the software survived me. I left the company in 2020 and 
Yeah, that's great. But I asked me, what is the strategy? Should they put in more maintenance now, or um, is it a build-and-forget strategy? To be honest, I don't know. But during the last years, I thought a lot about zombies. And maybe that's a bit crazy for you, but um, many of you, you build uh, complex software, and it's always um, hard to yeah, handle your zombies. And I show you a zombie. It's this one. It's a legacy zombie. And um, you have it everywhere in your old unmaintained software. And the thing is, there are small zombies, maybe if you only some front-end stack dependency updates, that's no problem. But if you have a critical business software and um, you don't put maintenance time in it, it can get a serious problem. And I lost a lot of lifetime explaining these uh, serious problems to my co-founders and other stakeholders. And what I noticed is they don't see the zombies. And this is the same view for a non-technical person. And um, to show the dramatic of this situation, I show you my view. And you think it's shortly before the end. And that's an inter interesting question. Um, how can we fix such a project if everything is shortly before the crash? And I will show you my top five learnings. And um, I think the main thing is not, to, not a technical thing. You have to plan with maintenance in mind. And that means if you are talking to your co-founders, your stakeholders, your leaders, um, m most companies, they, everyone pl just plans feature sprints, launching products, making the customer happy. But you don't have these maintenance phases where you just block time for fixing things or improving things keeping your business model healthy. Um, no one says at a board meeting, hey, I want this week where we all uh, have the time to fix our currently work working projects. But you should do. It's, and another thing is uh, we, we don't throw things away. Um, I don't know. When have you, uh, the, when was the last time when you uh, throw something away? A feature that didn't work. Um, last month, who, who throws something away from life in, during the last month because it didn't work? Ooh. <laughs> How do you explain it to your CEO? <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's the long-term goal, keeping the software lean, um, removing things that don't work or um, that are, aren't efficient, and saving some, some time for, yeah, having time for the real um, problems and the cool features that earn the money. The second learning, know your zombies. Um, I, met a I meet a lot of companies that say, oh, we have these problems and that problem and all that stuff. But I think it's really important to do your homework and make a prioritized list and talk about the main top five topics and only focus on that. Um, in many companies I'm working with, they have so much problems and it's really hard to keep focus, to stay focused. Yeah, and um, also use all the possibilities in monitoring and tracing, for example. When you are working with PHP, there's this wonderful Tideways product, for example. I, I don't have any shares, so, <laughs> but um, I, I forgot it, and now I'm working in a project where it saves a lot of time. 
Yeah, and, and the test uh, thing is also worth a look. Um, I'm not the biggest unit test uh, writer like Carsten, for example, <laughs> but uh, I think there's uh, an enormous power in just writing some E2E tests and test the business value of the product. So there's no excuse for not writing tests anymore. There are frameworks like uh, Cypress or Playwright where e even junior programmers can build really good tests. Yeah, number three learning. Um, I spend a lot of time using MC Edit in, yeah, <laughs> and fixing things uh, over SSH, SSH connections uh, on the live system. Yeah, and I see this still today. So it would be better to have some basic workflows, basic security fixes, and uh, yeah, roles. And it's always a problem. Um, even uh, you can you can communicate roles to your employees and everything. But when if the if the CTO um, opens the PHP MyAdmin and copies the live database, then it's not leading by example. So, yeah, my, sometimes it's hard, but you should use the best practices uh, for yourself too. And I'm a big fan of supportive layers. Um, even if the software is bad, you can put many things around and for example, you could put Varnish in front or do some rate limiting with Nginx, some reverse proxy cache, or yeah, that helps a lot in most cases. And um, I got to love um, proxy SQL. I don't know if you know it. Um, you can cache specific SQL requests that um, bring the website down, for example, when it when you are in TV or something like that. Yeah, and um, I'm always surprised um, how few people know all the features the HTTP protocol has. For example, you can save bandwidth um, by using the, the 304 modif not modified header and yeah, skip downloading or uh, transferring big files over and over again. Then there's number five. Um, management people like to do these big bang relaunches or we solve the problem in one big shot, but I don't believe in that and I tried. So, and yeah. In most cases, it doesn't make sense. So I would really, um, yeah, it's always better to do some small steps and stay focused on only some tasks. And don't try to be perfect because um, sometimes you you start to fix something and then you see another problem and you you try to solve this too, and that's the start of the end. So. And I have a bonus learning with me. Um, that's product management. You can see two lines, and most companies just have the delivery line. And that's the first thing I ask my customers, do you have uh, real product management? Uh, most customers say yes. And then I ask some, some more questions, and um, what they do is just project management. They put, uh, they write issues, and they implement it, and then they look at it and see, oh, it, they don't work. Okay, let's just build another, another feature. And, but you can save a lot of money if you do this product discovery thing right and have a, a dedicated product manager who thinks about features before implementing it. And that was a hard learning for us, uh, but I 
set up the product management at T3N, for example, and hired the first product manager, and this was a real game changer. So, and then there's this bonus slide for your CEO, or if you are the CEO, that's for you. You can print it out. I, I put some nice graphs on it. So, you, you can see on the left side, your revenue goes down. Not good. Your bonus is at risk. I w wouldn't do that. And on the other side, the revenue goes up, and everyone is happy. And sometimes it's just that simple. So in our world today, you're, you're searching developers, you want happy employees, and yeah, it's not just about saving maintenance costs. And to summarize it all, if you go home now, or today, <laughs> and <laughs> what should you keep in mind? Um, yeah, build and forget isn't uh, is, a, is an outdated strategy. You shouldn't use it anymore. And maybe you're inspired now to just talk to your customers when they pay you to build something. Um, think at selling them maintenance um, on top. And maybe you can use my slide from the. CEO perspective and give it to them. Yeah, and um, that's the funny part. Con if you do continuous maintenance, it, it's even cheap. It's cheaper than the other style. So, but it's hard to communicate. So, yeah, even from a business business perspective, it makes sense. And and my number one learning is block maintenance slots for everything, for every working product that earns you the money. Never stop maintaining. Know your legacy zombies, that's another thing. And yeah, use all that modern tooling even if your software stack is legacy. For example, you can use um, PHP 7 with Docker. I know that. <laughs> yeah, and start with small steps. Yeah, I, I think that's a good. Comparison, um, building software is like many marathons and not sprinting and building features. <laughs> and just keep a steady pace and invest in continuous maintenance. Thanks. Thank you very much, Martin, for these insights. <laughs> We do have a few questions. Yes. If you still have some questions, please submit them via the app, and we, will, we do have time to talk to Martin. So uh, the, the most important question um, at first, I guess, what happened to the cheese shop? Oh, <coughs> I have plans to rebuild it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my father sold the whole company again after I built the shop. <laughs> And now he's living in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> but not, I, I'm unsure if it is based on the cheese shop <laughs> price. Don't know. <laughs> uh, so, how do I convince my CEO to invest in maintenance? Any tips? Yeah, the, the main thing is it's cheaper in the long run. So, it's all about money and CEOs got that right, and if you show them the graphs, I think he will understand it. Or I, I so. see a pattern here. I think it was a similar uh, answer with the, with the rockets, where they said, yeah, you have to invest money, because if you wait too long, <laughs> it blows it will, up. Yeah? It will disintegrate, yeah. was it? So uh, is there a difference between tech debt and maintenance? Mm, tech debt is the problem. I didn't uh, mention the term, but it's the same, yes. Um, you have some legacy zombies, that's tech dev. And maintenance is fixing these things. So I, I guess I have a last question. Um, did you come to Berlin by bike? 
Ah. This, to start with. <laughs> Um, no, I, I thought about that, but uh, I have another event at this weekend. Okay. I'm, I go mountaineering with my s little sister. Yeah, and so that it would, would have taken too long. But I'm planning to do a trip through Germany from Flensburg to Garmisch this year, and I think that's enough. I have one more question. Oh, uh, Martin, you mentioned that maintenance blocks should be planned uh, in the regular development cycles. Do you have an idea, a percentage of time compared to feature development? Any experiences you have there? I know CEOs love KPIs, yes. but uh, that's, that totally depends on your team size and um, yes, strategic plans. Um, if you want to shift your whole business model, maybe you do a bit less maintenance phases, but um, yeah, if you continue, continue growing your b current business model, I, I would say something like maybe every month, at the end of the month, we just do maintenance for one week or such things. But you can have plans. You <laughs> also have to act according to your plans. And that's also something I see um, many companies have good ideas, but then the customer calls and says, oh, we have this new money for you. Please do this. So and then you need to you know, have a good leadership team that uh, handles this. Have you, have you seen any examples where that was done very well, where you saw a um, software project where maintenance was handled in a very good way? Mm, yes. Um, there's the king way of not needing maintenance blocks, but this is 1% of all tech companies, and you do just um, have a continuous release cycle, and everything is covered by tests. <laughs> then you don't need maintenance uh, blocks, but I, I didn't mention this be here because I don't think uh, we have companies here, but maybe some uh, real SaaS product companies do it like that, Spotify maybe, but um, I know some people but at Spotify, they have other problems. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. Please. Do rate Martin's talk in the app so that it's not, not too long until we will award the Best yes. Speaker Award. So thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. It was a pleasure.